Thank you, everyone, for coming today to the Chinese American Museum of Chicago. We're so excited to have Dr. Melody Lee visiting and presenting her book, Trans-Pacific Cartographies. Um, she's just going to be giving a brief book uh, talk with us here today, um, and then we'll have some time for Q and A, and you can maybe see her dead performances as well and pick up a copy of the book. But um, my name is Caroline Ng. I am the executive director here. I just joined the museum a couple months ago. So I am really thrilled to be able to kick off some of our programming here with Melody, um, a longtime friend. Um, thanks to Suman for the introduction. Um, we have a really supportive board here, really supportive community leaders. Um, and so I really hope that you guys can also spend some time after, have some drinks, have some uh, snacks, and get to know one another and come back again for all the things that we are hoping to do together here. And so, yeah. Have a good day. Uh, Caroline and I want to thank you all for making it on a Saturday morning and thank you specifically for the museum and I know some of the board members and founders here so I'm really delighted and honored to be here and share my book with you. Also thank you so long. Uh, last year I came visit and I just said like I just asked him you know, I want to research Chinese American writers and dancers. Like, can you find anything for me? And I just bugged them for two days. <laughs> um, I, I feel like so it's a very special place for me. So I'm very happy to visit. I also have some friends uh, in town, actually recently moved into town or lived here. And then I'm very happy to see you again. Actually, uh, Kristen was in a writing group with me for four years where this book was written and produced. So thanks for the writing group. We keep each other accountable, right? Medicine and writing. <laughs> We're long distance, but <clears throat> you know, we have shared goal. A very good friend, Angela, like, uh, she took me here. Uh, I'm very lost with her. <laughs> so, well, Thank you so much again for making it today. So as Caroline mentioned, I also like to dance. So hopefully someday uh, we could do a Chinese dance uh, event again. But today I'm not, you know, dance gear. <laughs> so we'll talk about books. But we might want to breathe in and breathe out, right? Let's breathe in and breathe out. Hmm. So I hope we are all awake now, right? And there are some snacks also at the back. Uh, I want to share with you my very recently published book. Uh, it was actually published in, like, the publication date is December last year, but it just came out. So um, this is one of the first in-person talks I've done. Uh, so if you have any feedback or any question, feel free to stop me anytime. I will just give like a brief introduction of my talk uh, like of the book and then if you want to get copies like I will have uh, signed copies and then I bring some like little hints as well and any question that you will have uh, for me and I want to learn more about you all. So the topic is like Chinese diaspora literature so that's basically what my view was on. Uh, of course my next project is probably on Chinese diaspora dance uh, as a connection. So like how it started. So this is uh, actually very related to my personal experience. I grew up in overseas Chinese village in Canton, China, very southern part of China. I know a lot of you from Hong Kong, so uh, it's very close to Hong Kong. And you know, I grew up with my grandparents, and they were the <coughs> Hua Chao, right? Like Hua Q. <coughs> so with with them, these Chinese going back to China. Uh, so one of them was, so I grew up in the overseas Chinese village where I was surrounded by Chinese overseas coming back to China from Southeast Asia. 
Okay, so I was very interested in this like sense of identity and home, right? Like if I felt like I was there, but at the same time that their sense of home is fractured. And I shared that same sense of experience. Then in my college, uh, the first two years I spent time in Sun Yat-sen University, one of the most famous universities in Guangdong. And, uh, but the campus I was in actually is in Zhuhai because we are the first cohort of School of Translation and Interpretation, you know, Fan Yi Xu Yuan in Zhuhai. And do you all know why the, the campus was set up in Zhuhai? I guess. So it was actually the first year of like the, the school of translation and criticism, and it was deliberately set in Zhuhai. Uh, that campus was in Zhuhai because the uh, it is the very hometown of the very first overseas Chinese students, Yong Wei. Yeah, I'm sure many of you have heard of him. Uh, he was the very first overseas Chinese students from China to the United States, graduated from Yale, and very famous in 1854. And he has written on his experience in the West, right? So he's very famous in terms of, it's like, you know, introducing the American culture and the overseas Chinese studies back to home. Then he went back to China and persuaded the Qing government to send more students like to the United States. Therefore, he was a pioneer in overseas Chinese students. And based on this experience, and of course, later on, I myself became an overseas Chinese student myself. Uh, so I finished my bachelor and master's in uh, China and Hong Kong. Then I came to the United States, Washington University in St. Louis, actually pretty close to here. Uh, so we drove here all the time when we were in grad school, like five hours. Then we figured out it's too expensive to park in downtown, uh, or it's just taking the train afterwards. <laughs> So in St. Louis, um, and that's when I get acquainted with the Midwest, like uh, you know, Chinese immigrant community, and as I became one. So I became an overseas Chinese student myself. So then I have this all these inquiries together to put into this book, and in the middle of this Sino-U.S. tension, right? As you know, uh, Sino-U.S. tension has been going on and then the uh, relationship has been up and down for the past many decades. Uh, but, you know, when I talk to friends that's 10 years older than me, they always say, oh, I came to the United States, especially New York, Chicago, because of this book, Manhattan's Chinese Woman. I don't know if any of you heard of it. It was by Zhou Li. So um, it was about this, like, you know, uh, woman that become a very successful businesswoman uh, back in the day, like in, in the 80s, like, and then she landed in uh, Manhattan and became, you know, it's a very typical American dream story, right? Uh, so a lot of my friends that's about 10 years older than me actually came here because imagining they could become one of them. Right? And then later on in the 90s, uh, which is the show that I will talk about today, Beijing or in New York uh, was you know, shut in 1993. And this was a typical dystopian story. So it's you know, talking about well, this couple came to the United States just you know, to get better life. But later on, you know, it's not what they imagined. They lost everything. They got really rich, but then they lost everything. Right, so these stories are actually the binary, uh, binary narratives that we see a lot in Chinese American stories. But my book is kind of get entering into this discourse and trying to debunk this narrative, like that's owning binary, right? So it's not just one side or the other, especially as we see the last few years in the increasing Sino-US tension. Of course, you've seen news and news together in 2022. I submitted my book 2022. So those are the uh, events that I capture. You see the boycott of Beijing Olympics. Then Biden wants to see of consequences, right? Like if they help uh, uh, Russia. Then how? Uh, and then of course in uh, August, if you remember, Pelosi uh, like visited Taiwan, and then it the, like you know had a big red flag, and then started this tension again. But this is nothing new, right? As Chinese American community in the United States, we've known that 
xenophobia and sinophobia have been happening from the 19th century up to now. Just the different expressions are different. In fact, if we think about it, we have this model minority discourse that we are always the smart ass, right? But in fact, that is the other coin of this discourse, right? It's no matter how they put us, we are still that two sides that fit into the mainstream discourse. And the xenophobia, anti-Asian racism gets fired up during the pandemic, as many of you know, uh, like a lot of um, news. And then uh, previous president Donald Trump even called coronavirus Chinese virus. That doesn't help, right? Um, so because of all these, in fact, uh, I started like a story map project with my students during the, uh, during the, the pandemic time. Uh, talking about UH, I'm, I teach at the University of Houston. We have an excellent uh, graduate here, Angela. Uh, she graduated, she was our student a few years back and graduated and got her master's at <coughs> UVA and currently has a good job, so very proud of her. And we have some students that work with me on this project on anti-Asian uh, incidents. So we document incidents in the three big states that have a lot of uh, Chinese American population, including California, uh, Texas, and New York. And then we compare different stories and what are the what are the uh, microaggressions and then incidents, right? So compared to before that, maybe two, like a decade before, a lot of my friends and Chinese Americans can easily claim they have double citizenship, they have, they have double identities of China and the United States. But today it actually becomes harder to claim this double no, uh, loyalty and identity. And so one of the examples that we saw is the, in 2022 Beijing Olympics. The Chinese, very, Chinese government's very different reaction and responses to these free Chinese uh, ethnicity, but Chinese ethnicity, but U.S. born athletes, right? They have like very different responses. Actually, really, uh, really reminds us this sense of home and identity, like a Chineseness, is always precarious to Chinese American identity, right? Chinese American population. So under these discourse that I um, that I introduce, like I focus in my book, uh, the new immigrant writers. So when what I define as new immigrants are a term that used to refer to Chinese immigrants who began leaving China for the United States in the late seventies. But in literary discourse, a lot of them like started writing in the eighties and nineties. And I want to focus on that uh, started in the 80s, developed in the 90s, and mature in the beginning of 2000. Those are the group that I study. So include Sinophone and Anglophone writers. Uh, Anglophone writers, you're probably very familiar with Ha Jing, uh, who is one of the most famous Chinese American writers of date. And also uh, for the for the Sinophone writers, uh, Yan Geling is the most famous ones. But there are also those that are less known, including Shi Yu, Rong Rong, and Chen Chen. Uh, so those are ch like writers that was like really free to were free to going back and forth between the China and the United States. But today it's still like becoming harder because of the current political situation. I focus on the notion of home as this is like something that really uh, like echo in a lot of Chinese American like identity and Chinese immigrants. As I also mentioned in the beginning of the talk that my personal experience and the notion of home is like always entangled. So when I talk about home, it's not only uh, like means the physical space, but more so the feeling, the sense of belonging. That's what I want to focus on in these writings. Following the previous research on these multiplicity and uh, fluidity of home, that the notion of home in China, uh, diaspora studies is no longer that you know rooted identity, but instead is like routed, right? Wherever we stop, it could be home. These writers actually really uh, present this fluctuating sense of home. And in my book, I also use like the theoretical framework of literary cartography and geography. And this is actually uh, for, for very personal reason, as I 
mentioned and Caroline mentioned, I'm a dancer and I've done Chinese dance for many years. And Rain was just came in and she was actually on my dance team and we are organizing something, right? So next time we can dance together here. Uh, so you know, so the uh, the sense, so when I, but my training, academic training is literary, like literary studies. So I want to do dance for my next project, like kind of, so far I've been doing a lot of dance workshop, I've been dancing, but it's like my, I have two separate trajectory or two separate routes. So one of the things I was thinking about to link my literary projects to dance project is the idea or notion of like space and place, right? Uh, actually, I came here uh, for a conference, Popular Culture Studies, and uh, I presented a paper on the dance hall yesterday. Uh, so like kind of presenting on the Ge Wu Ting in the 1990s, early 1990s, as the transition space between socialists like China and the market economy. So I figured dance space and place is a good way to connect literature and, and dance. So I use mapping and cartography as my theoretical framework for my book. And of course, that's not the only reason, uh, but also some of the metaphors and literary like, narrative in the book really have this mapping meta metaphor. As you see in this book, uh, Ha Jin's 2007, A Free Life, at the end, it's the like, protagonist, Nan, and uh, the narrator actually writes poem. So that's its ending with the poetry collection uh, from him. And then it writes, under his pencil, a land is emerging. He says, I'm making a country where you can build your home. So this idea is very powerful in terms of we can actually make our home through art, through literature, right? I know a couple artists here and really admire your work. I know that literature, art, and humanities um, are not recognized, or we are not recognized as much as we deserve, but what you are doing is really powerful because, you know, in the sense of this, it's like a sense of like making home for themselves that beyond the boundaries of geography. So in order to understand uh, the the sense of home in these aspects literature, I feel literary cartography is very useful framework. Just uh, for instance, Peter Churchy, one of the scholar said to ask for a map is to say, tell me a story. So storytelling itself is a process of map making. And in fact, you know, like if we go to unfamiliar place, right, I need to look at Google map. I'm actually pretty lost, like geographically. <laughs> that's why I studied literary geography, um, because that's uh, the metaphor that we can go beyond the geography, right? So, uh, you know, like, so somewhere unfamiliar, strange, is actually the starting point uh, in, uh, according to Peter Turchi, to be, like, to start a story is to be lost, right? The journey can't begin until we set down a place somewhere unfamiliar. So this aligns, like, you know, really aligns with the, like, diaspora who are lost in a strange land. So this mapping uh, metaphor is very powerful. And I argue that contemporary Chinese diaspora writers narrate their immigrant stories to those back home or in the Sinophone community to make sense of their experience and the sense of belonging. So when we write, we also by the, like, I don't know if you, uh, you know, you realize, I also like creative work, like writing, dancing, right? Uh, through the process, I really feel it's not only just like narrate our experience to the world, but also like figuring our own break, like own experience and own identity. So these writings uh, that I study, they overlay the exotic maps of US on the nostal uh, nostalgic maps of the homeland or create effect effective maps of their personal experience or draw political maps between the two countries. Also, there are maps that uh, provide guides for trans-Pacific journey like this book shows. Um, also, this, these writers contribute to global Asians, which is a very, um, very popular framework right now that's uh, like kind of bridging Asian American studies and Asian studies. 
So this is the structure of my book. Like basically, it's kind of narrowed down. So I start from the question of like different sense of mapping different uh, narratives of home, right? So first, uh, from Ha Jin's is like book. Uh, a map of betrayal. It is a book about national identity. So basically, talking about like how he maps experience of like uh, the national identity and this national sense of home in this book. And then the second one, you know, uh, when we talk about in in Chinese context, we know that when we talk about Guo, it relates to Jia because even the term nation. Translation is 国家, right? So this name, the term of 国 and 家, like nation and family, can never separate it, right? Like they are very intertwined. However, during the Mao era, this like gets threatened, right? Because there's not so-called like 国 and 家 together. You know, the political regime really suppressed the sense of uh, 家 and family. So Lu Fan Yan Shi, like I'm looking at Yan Geling's novel and how it creates this kata, like cartograph the mm, dystopia in this sense, like suppressing sense of home. And then the third chapter focus on those contemporary new Sinophone writers that write in Chinese. They they are less known in the academic world, but they are very interesting. And the way they avoid the political attention is to write about affects, write about romantic emotional stories, right? So uh, New York Lover is the one example of that. And the last chapter that I focus on the contested sites in overseas Chinese immigrant stories for two TV shows, which I will elaborate. Um, and my coda did touch on, does touch on the online literature during COVID because a lot of Chinese immigrants were not able to travel or publish back home, so then they start to like publish online. So that's uh, what I will elaborate in my future studies. So I want to show you a little bit of the last chapter, which I talk about the two TV shows. They're roughly twenty years apart. And they both produce in China, actually, but uh, but talk about the lives in of Chinese immigrants and ch overseas Chinese students. And as I mentioned, Beijing in New York is a very famous show in 1993. It just got like blown out, like everyone knows about it during then. And it's about a couple that when came to the United States, got what they want, became really rich. Like first, it was very difficult, right? Like from washing dishes to working in restaurants and laundry. But later on, got like successful business, and then because of bad investment, they lost everything, right? So basically, it's a dystopia American dream story. Whereas Squish Shu Lai, the way we were, um, like focus on this very famous couple in China now, uh, Tang Yuan Luo Jing in 2018, and then they focus on the overseas Chinese students, like four uh, four students coming to the United States, and they were. Thinking of the question of like Gui Shu Lai, all right, like uh, whether we go or not go. I argue this uh, chapter creates a kind of palimpsest. I don't know uh, any of you like have ever seen palimpsest, but if you go to archive, I'm sure uh, people work in museums know palimpsest very well because, uh, like you know, when we like look at the archives in the old, you know, the old medieval texts, for instance, like you can see layers of layers, right? And these layers, when you, you know, it's on top of each other, but you will see the traces of the old layer. It never go away. So there are these like really interesting layers. So I basically use this metaphor to say these two shows have like rejoiced the maps of American dream to be more uncertain while layering on top of older immigrants map. What, whereas the other show rejoiced the map of Chinese dream, but it's different from the official discourse of Chinese dream at the same time. Um, I know the the sound is some. <laughs> Can you hear? So this is from the uh, left of the show, the Beijing are in New York. At the beginning of the show, you can see the excitement of the couple when they first uh, went to the United States.
you see this、uh, this clip, little clip from the beginning of the show shows like the extreme excitement they came to the、uh, city. I know that probably doesn't happen to us anymore because China is like really、uh, now economically great.、Um, but back in back in the 1990s, right, the, where this show is about,、uh, it shows this like you know extreme excitement. And you can see she, he actually was a shallow player like in China, so you can see he was like conducting the,、uh, the music. And then it shows like this transition from the skyline, like beautiful,、uh, like Manhattan scene, and then zooming back to the like very excited faces. And then if you notice, the sound is actually the Streisand Forever, right? So,、uh, you know, so it's like very patriotic kind of feeling about American dream.、Uh, yet this scene was contracted. <laughs> Was contracted with the scene nest when they actually was dropped off by her aunt in the basement apartment in Manhattan. It really shows like their disappointment, right? Being chopped off by the aunt, and then the aunt actually asked them to return this one month、uh, rent to them at the end of the month,、uh, and then it was like a dark basement apartment, unlike something they dreamed of. So again, it's like a dystopia. Uh, sense of American dream. So there are also like images in the show that really shows us like heaven and hell images like parallel to each other. For instance, when like Bo Yan was like sitting here, it first zoom out to this like beautiful skyline of Manhattan, then zoom into her disappointed look that is nothing as、uh, she seen. As well as when he,、uh, the husband had to work in the restaurant, you can see the focal point is all these dishes, and he was like buried behind, like he's living like a hell、uh, and didn't have enough. So that was in the beginning of their American、oh, like life, and later on they did become rich, and then they lost everything. But so this show like really paints like New York and America as a palimpsest map.、Uh, what I meant is like the layers of maps 
uh, where has the old map that really repeats the American dream as this material construct that we think about, but at the same time dismiss it by it and can deconstructs it. And constructs and dramatizes New York as an in-between spaces. Right? Uh, the other show in 2018, which like they raised these overseas Chinese students. Uh, and it's very different from the first show because, like again, uh, like it's focused on this life of Chinese dream. You know, with like these days we talk a lot about Chinese dream. Like when I went back last time, which was already five years ago, everywhere had these signs of Chinese dream, right? Like the metro station, the park, and everything. But this show, as interestingly, it does show this idea of Chinese dream. Because as the title taken, right, Gui Chu Lai, actually from this very famous poem by Tao Yuanming, right, Gui Chu Lai Shi Tian Yuan Zhang Wu. So returns, returning home, it is a big theme of this. But, but it uh, compares with the overseas Chinese students in the 60s, 70s, they actually add a new sense of map, right? Their sense of returning is no longer like the 60s, 70s when we talk about like, oh, South Zhuguo, right? Like to return to homeland, to help the homeland, the nation. But their sense of return, their reasons of returning now is more for personal, effective, like, or individual reasons. So this idea of who goes, who comes, stands in the middle of the show. And basically, it just talks about, you know, like this idea of Chinese dream is not the same as the official idea of Chinese dream. It's like adding a personal and effective layer to it as well. So these two shows really like, uh, I think, have some multiple layers of maps that we can, we can reintroduce and connect to. And this is kind of the framework that I use uh, in the overarching book. Uh, basically, different, different kinds of metaphors of theoretical framework of mapping that uh, talking about like how uh, construct different sense of home, uh, no matter it's national or familiar or effective or personal. So in the end, uh, that's like, I hope this would give us like some ideas of my book, but also like I know that there are artists and you know, also uh, like no matter what you do, you know, I know like you do so much good work here in the museum and also the artists and professionals. And then no matter what we do as Chinese immigrant community, I think it gives us some hope and some ideas that we can map our sense of home through our work. Thank you so much and 